So the past 12 months have been unusually exciting ones for anyone with an interest in very early recorded sound as a succession of newly audible recordings from the 1880s has attracted worldwide media attention, enabling us to listen in for the first time in living memory on some key episodes in the history of sound recording. Now, this morning, I'd like to review each of these recent developments in archaeophony with you in turn, outlining how they've been identified and contextualized, why each of them is significant, and what might be next. Two years ago at the Ars Conference in New Orleans, uh, Jerry Fabris, who I'm sure is familiar to most of you as curator of sound recordings at Thomas Edison National Historical Park, and who's here with us, uh, are Jerry? Yeah, okay. Ah, right, right here. Uh, he told me about this uh, metal ring preserved in the collection there, bent out of shape with a phonograph recording on it. Um, I thought this looked pretty interesting, so with Jerry's encouragement, I put in a formal duplication request so that we could get the ball rolling and see if uh, we could hear this recording. Well, Jerry quickly determined that it wouldn't be feasible to play the ring on the archaeophone he ordinarily uses for cylinder transfer work. It was so badly misshapen that the stylist just couldn't track it. So he turned for help to Carl Haber and Earl Cornell at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, who, as I'm sure most of you are aware, have been working for some years in collaboration with the Library of Congress on optical scanning systems that can play fragile or damaged analog recordings using a beam of light without physically touching their surfaces, the IRENE project, uh, which Dr. France mentioned just a moment ago. And they were able to digitize it successfully, revealing a woman's voice reciting, twinkle, twinkle, little star. So that sounds very much like the sort of recording that would have been made for a talking doll. Well, as you may know, the talking dolls Edison first put on the market in 1890 had contained wax cylinders. However, a few written sources found mainly in old newspapers revealed that for a brief time in the fall of 1888, the cylinders for prototype phonograph dolls had been made of tin. So it was that in July 2011, Thomas Edison National Historical Park issued a press release, Early Talking Doll Recording Discovered. Now, that was quite a story right there. Uh, but one other thing stands out in those newspaper accounts from 1888. Uh, one article stated of the tin doll records that, quote, there were uh, two young ladies in the room who were continually talking to the tiny speaking machines, which a skilled workman was turning out in great numbers. First, the fact that these women were doing this work continually suggested that they must have been employed to do it rather than just doing it for fun, which arguably made them the world's first professional phonograph performers. Uh, documents like this one show people who performed for Edison's wax cylinder phonograph getting travel costs reimbursed as early as June 1888, but I've seen no sign of actual payments until 1889. Second, the fact that the mechanisms were being made, quote, in great numbers, suggested that the laboratory was stockpiling records with the idea they would eventually be sold, which, if true, would make these the earliest recordings made for commercial sale, even though they were never actually put on the market because the phonograph doll ended up being radically redesigned. So a lot of the headlines ended up looking like this, uh, scientists play world's oldest commercial record. Uh, maybe that should be put in a, a slightly more nuanced way. I think there's a good case that can be made for that. What I am sure, though, is that this is the oldest known recording made in America of a female voice. <laughs> 
Early recorded sound was back in the news again in December 2011 when the playback was announced of six experimental recordings made during the early 1880s and preserved today at the Smithsonian Institution's National Museum of American History as part of a much larger collection of similar materials. Now, although the news media often referred to these recordings as, quote, made by Alexander Graham Bell, uh, they're more properly understood as products of the Volta Laboratory in Washington, D.C., where Alexander Graham Bell worked together with the, preci the precision instrument maker, Charles Sumner Tainter, and the chemist, Chichester Bell, on experiments in the mediation of sound. The announcement in December 2011 marked the culmination of a pilot project on which curators Carlene Stevens and Sherry Stout had been collaborating since 2009 with Library of Congress digital conversion specialist Peter Allier and Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory scientists Carl Haber and Earl Cornell, the team whose non-invasive optical playback technique had succeeded in recovering audio from that tin talking doll cylinder. Now, the purpose of the pilot project was to find out whether that same technique could be used to play back a few representative recordings in the Volta Laboratory collection. And as it turned out, it could. Uh, at the time of the announcement, I had the good fortune to be at the Smithsonian myself with the generous support of a Lemelson Center Fellowship to study the larger group of recordings from which the six sample items had been taken, uh, using laboratory notebooks and uh, various other sources to try to figure out what they were. Uh, so I was able to bring some of that research to bear on the sounds which the pilot project recovered. Now, back in 1880, Alexander Graham Bell and Sumner Tainter had been working together not on the phonograph, but on the photophone, an invention for transmitting speech and other sounds wirelessly using a modulated beam of light. Uh, but while doing this, they had developed some distinctive speech habits that were to remain with them, uh, including the use of the trilled R as a test utterance, you know, Rrr. So here's a transcription of a photophone experiment in parallel columns with uh, what had been spoken into the transmitter on one side and what the other experimenter thought he heard from the receiver on the other side. Now sometimes the two texts match and sometimes they don't, but the insertion of trilled R's at regular intervals uh, created reliable reference points they could use to keep track of where they were at all times. I'll call this a reference trill. Uh, their assumption seems to have been that their equipment would respond reliably to a trilled R if it would respond to anything at all. In 1881, when the Volta Associates took up the recording of sound in earnest, they continued to use reference trills in their experiments. Here you see a laterally modulated disc recording prepared on June 4th, 1881. This is the oldest actual Volta sound recording I was able to identify at the Smithsonian. Now, I don't know what's on the face of this disc, uh, but Tainter reused the same disc for a second sound recording experiment two days later, not on the face this time, but on the rim uh, with two ridges. Uh, Tainter's notes say, the word potato was impressed upon one ridge and several trilled R's upon the other. You can get a sense for the type of things they liked to record. Uh, next, the Volta Associates began pursuing the idea of playing back recorded sound by aiming a jet of air at the groove of the Edison phonograph uh, shown here. The recording still preserved on it today, made on or shortly before September 25th, 1881, is probably the most widely quoted example of a 19th century test recording. Uh, according to written documentation, it runs, rrr, rrr, there are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamed of in our philosophy. Rrr, I am a graphophone and my mother was a phonograph. <laughs> the uh, rrr, uh, written TRR has often been mistranscribed in the secondary literature as GRR or TRA, uh, but it was plainly a trilled R used as a reference trill to mark the beginning and to separate the Shakespeare quotation from the closing sentence. Uh, this recording hasn't been played in living memory, but you can actually see the reference trill at the beginning of the recording. If you look closely at the grooves shown on the screen, you'll spot regularly alternating clusters of deep and shallow craters, which is exactly what we would expect a recorded trill to look like. In October 1881, 
Alexander Graham Bell left for Europe, and his colleagues turned to methods of duplicating sound recordings by electrically depositing a layer of metal on a recorded wax disc, and then using the metal negative to stamp out copies. In this way, a piece of music, for instance, can be recorded once, Tainter speculated, and any number of copies made from this original record and the music reproduced from each of the copies, a staggering thought at the time. So with this in mind, they prepared the electrotype you see here. Now the plan had been to use this negative to stamp out playable duplicates, but because of its obvious defects, you can see there's a big chunk missing, uh, they instead deposited it in a sealed box at the Smithsonian to document what they'd been up to, which is how it came to be there. But what's on it? Well, such written documentation as I could find identifies the disk's content only vaguely as, quote, words and sounds shouted into the mouthpiece. But this was one of the disks chosen for that pilot project. And here's what they managed to recover from the copper disk. Did you catch that? Now, at first, the folks at uh, Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory thought they, they might be dealing here with a set of test tones, uh, maybe from a tuning fork, but, but here's what I believe we're hearing. Uh, this might seem like just the 1881 equivalent of testing, testing, one, two, three, but, but consider, at long last, we finally get to hear what one of those reference trills they used constantly in their work actually sounded like. And it's a lot funnier than I would have expected. <laughs> Another recording chosen for the pilot project was this brilliant green vertical cut wax disc probably recorded by Chichester Bell about 1884. <laughs> I believe that's the oldest recording of a literary recitation in the English language we can listen to today. Uh, two other recordings chosen for the pilot project had been made photographically on circular glass plates. Now, a few different methods were used at the time to accomplish this sort of thing. They're all, all described in a later patent. Uh, some involved a jet of ink being modulated directly by the voice, as in the setup you see shown here. Uh, but the two discs played back as part of the pilot project seem to have been made not with an ink jet, but with an ordinary membrane and stylus. Now, here's how that worked. In one case, the stylus moved parallel to a slit like this, such that when the slit was exposed to light and a surface covered with photographic emulsion was moved past it, the speech vibrations were recorded as bands of varying width, like this. Now here's a test recording the Volt Associates made that way on November 17th, 1884, the word barometer repeated over and over again. This is not the first time this recording has been played at an ARS conference. Uh, Floyd Harvey uh, used the same disc as the basis for a playback experiment some 30 years ago. Uh, but here's what the pilot project managed to get out of it. <laughs> Barometer. In other cases, the stylus moved perpendicular to a slit like this, such that when the slit was exposed to light and the photographic surface moved past it, this produced a pattern of lighter and darker bands depending on how long each successive point had been exposed. And that's how I believe they recorded this disc. Now, there's been some controversy over the words, and I'd like to draw your attention particularly to the part the Smithsonian officially transcribes as, oh no. Oh, <laughs> 
In case you don't know, I should mention that how is that for high was roughly equivalent in the 19th century to our modern expression, how do you like them apples? Uh, the Volta associates often like to use that as a test phrase. But did you hear, oh no? Now, so apparently something went wrong with the experiment, uh, and the speaker had to stop and restart the recording. You can see this big black splotch where the interruption happened. So he utters an exclamation of disappointment and dismay. So even though the Smithsonian's official transcription is, oh no, the unanimous consensus among researchers who've spent time with this recording appears to be this. <laughs> now, I, I, I can see why there may have been some reluctance to embrace this interpretation, if only to avoid headlines, something like, scientists play back world's first recorded F-bomb. <laughs> or perhaps something like the title of this blog entry. Uh, still, I believe the, the, the F-bomb interpretation is appealing because it humanizes the inventive process so vividly. Uh, the, the equipment malfunctioned or something else went wrong, so what did the experimenter do instinctively? He, he swore, and the results go echoing on through the ages. <laughs> Given the success of the pilot project, the natural question is, uh, what might be next? Well, first, I'd say the voice of Alexander Graham Bell appears to be within fairly easy reach, although none of the recordings played back so far appears to contain his voice. There are several recordings in the collection that do, including the one shown here, and there's uh, great interest in hearing them. Of course, this would be the same voice that famously spoke the words, Mr. Watson, come here, I want to see you, into an experimental telephone on March 26th, 1876. And then there's the recording seen in these two photographs, the top one taken at the Volta Laboratory in 1885, the bottom one taken at the Smithsonian many years later. While it, re it remains mounted on the machine today, it has an inscription in its center area, Killarney and Hot Shot March. Now, if that's what's really on it, that, I believe, would make this the oldest known American recording of music. Maybe we'll get to hear it soon. Stay tuned. The six Volta recordings chosen for the pilot project were all discs, but the Volta Laboratory Associates are really better known for their contributions in the cylinder field. During the later half of, uh, latter half of 1885, they designed a prototype business dictation machine that recorded vertically on wax-coated cylinders, and they approached the Edison interests looking to join forces. However, they weren't able to reach an agreement, so ultimately, the idea of the wax cylinder machine ended up being developed in two different directions. First, by the Volta Associates into the Bell Tainter graphophone, and separately by the Edison interests into the rival Edison phonograph. Now, notwithstanding claims that Edison was only interested in the phonograph as a business dictation tool at this point, musical recording was a priority for him, and we know this because in February of 1888, he hired this guy, Adalbert Theodor Eduard Wangemann, to work full-time on, quote, experimenting on phonograph recording with a view of making better musical records, vocal and instrumental. What does that make Wangemann? Well, it makes him the world's first professional sound recordist, that is, the first person whose primary job was to coordinate musical recording sessions and to develop improved methods of capturing musical performances. From an artistic standpoint, he might well be regarded as the central figure in the earliest history of the new wax cylinder phonograph. Uh, Wangemann's efforts had apparently borne fruit by the 11th of May, 1888, uh, this often overlooked event when Edison invited the press to his laboratory to hear his new phonograph tackle performances of instrumental music for the first time. Uh, but the phonograph itself was still very much a work in progress during this period. The event I just mentioned came well before this famous photograph of June 16th, 
1888 following a marathon work session that resulted in the so-called perfected phonograph. And Wangemann was literally right there in the middle of all this. His regular workplace was room 13 up on the third floor of Edison's laboratory, also known as the music room or lecture room. Here's an engraving published in late 1889, which shows how the space had looked earlier that year. Uh, notice in particular the, the, the many funnels of different shapes and sizes that Wangemann used in his experiments, trying to see which would best capture particular types of content. As he worked out the principles of the art of recording sound pretty much from scratch, by far, the most famous exhibition venue for the new phonograph in this period was the Paris Universal Exposition of 1889, where the new wax cylinder phonograph was introduced to large numbers of people on the European continent for the first time. And on June 15th, Wangemann left for France to lend his personal expertise to the phonograph exhibit. Uh, here you see a note in the laboratory recording ledger documenting his departure. At the ARSC conference in Los Angeles uh, last May, Jerry Fabris told me about an intriguing box of cylinders he had just digitized. He wasn't sure what he was hearing from the individual cylinders, which were unlabeled, except that many of them seemed to be in German or to have German announcements. But scratched into the sides of the box itself were the names Edison and Wangemann. Now, Jerry invited me to, to help try to figure out what they were. And when I listened to the transfers he'd made, I quickly recognized from some of the German announcements that we were dealing with recordings from Wangemann's fabled trip to Europe. After I'd taken a stab at identifying some of them, I turned for help to my German colleague, Stefan Puy, who did the lion's share of the identification and transcription. Uh, then on January 30th of this year, Thomas Edison National Historical Park released the audio to the public, and you can listen to all of it on their website. Uh, one of the cylinders turned out to have been recorded by Wangemann in Paris during the exposition, a Russian melody sung by a Hungarian quartet. Best of my knowledge, this is the only Edison cylinder from the Paris Universal Exposition of 1889 that has been played in living memory. Uh, that said, it's apparently not the only one that exists. Uh, another thing that turned up at the Smithsonian during my Lemelson Center Fellowship was this box of cylinders brought back from the exposition by William J. Hammer, who had been in charge of the Edison exhibit there as a whole. Now, none of these cylinders has yet been digitized, and many of them appear to be stuck to the pegs in the box, which poses a special problem. Uh, but their contents promise to be pretty significant, judging from paper slips inside the box with inscriptions like this. Violin played on the Eiffel Tower, November 6, 1889. Uh, newspaper accounts confirm that a number of recordings, including a violin recording, were made on the Eiffel Tower on November 6, 1889, in Eiffel's own apartment on a phonograph given to him personally by Thomas Edison when the tower itself had only been open for a few months. Other cylinders are identified on a torn paper originally attached to the lid of the box with many of the titles scratched out as though the contents of the box had, had varied over time and some selections had apparently been recorded in America and sent to Paris for exhibition such as a, a banjo cylinder, almost certainly the oldest surviving recording of a banjo, and a selection by Miss Effie Stewart at Orange, New Jersey. But other recordings on the list were made in Paris. Uh, this cylinder of Frenchmen talking, for example, and this one identified as flute, Eiffel Tower. Uh, newspaper accounts established that a flute recording was made on the Eiffel Tower during the same event as that violin recording, and that the performer was Paul Tafanel, 
who is, if I may shamelessly quote Wikipedia, regarded as the founder of the French flute school that dominated much of flute composition and performance during the mid-20th century. This would be the only known recording of Paul Toffanel, whose biographer recently lamented that nobody knew what had become of it. But Theo Wangemann was long gone by the time those Eiffel Tower recordings were made. In September of 1889, he left Paris for Germany. Here you see the passport application he filed at the American Legion in Paris. He ended up staying overseas until February of 1890, much longer than anticipated, undertaking a legendary set of travels during which he introduced Edison's new phonograph to a large swath of Central Europe and made recordings of a great many famous musicians and statesmen. Until recently, only one solitary recording was known to survive from Wangemann's trip, a cylinder of Johannes Brahms playing a segment of his first Hungarian dance in Vienna on December 2nd, 1889. It's in rough shape, so much so that there's been a long debate over the wording of the announcement, whether it's in the voice of Brahms or Wangemann, and even what language it's in. Um, as to the piano performance, one critic has described it as so noisy that, quote, any musical value heard can be charitably described as the product of a pathological imagination. <laughs> While another claims it's, quote, so miserable that one might think that the artist played behind a closed door. In short, the sole known surviving example of the many recordings Wangemann made in Europe was rather notorious as a disappointment. But the newly digitized box of cylinders at Thomas Edison National Historical Park has turned out to contain many more examples of recordings Wangemann uh, again, the world's first professional sound recordist, made in Germany and Austria during late 1889 and early 1890. Here are a couple excerpts of his recordings of other prominent pianists of that period. These and other cylinders in the same group vindicate Wangemann's reputation as a recordist and show us, among other things, just how great a loss it is that the Brahms cylinder wasn't preserved as well as these. Uh, that last recording also made headlines in Poland as the oldest Chopin recording. Uh, but what, what's really captured people's attention has been a cylinder containing the only known recording of Otto von Bismarck, the first chancellor of a unified German state. Uh, even though Bismarck's name isn't mentioned in the recording, Stefan Puy was able to identify it because of the announced place and date and because the spoken content had been described in the popular press. Bismarck talking to the phonograph had been big news back in 1889. It seems Wangemann had gone to Bismarck's home at Friedrichsruhe and asked him to record a formal message of greeting to Germans in the United States. And although Bismarck refused to go along with that scheme, he did make a record at the urging of his wife, reciting some song lyrics in English, German, Latin, and French. Bismarck researchers had been searching for it for years, and now at long last 
here it is. That last bit was a personal message from Bismarck to his son, Herbert. Now, the discovery of a Bismarck voice recording was news in the United States. It made the New York Times, for instance, but it was big news in Germany, where Bismarck's significance as founder of the country is something like that of George Washington for us as Americans. But, but two details received particular interest. The first was Bismarck's recitation of the Marseillaise, uh, the French national anthem, which surprised some people given the prominent part Bismarck played in provoking the Franco-Prussian War. Uh, it suggests he had a more nuanced relationship with the French culture and state than we might assume. Uh, the second detail was the actual sound of Bismarck's voice. According to the written accounts on which past histories have been based, Bismarck spoke in a Fistelstimme, a thin falsetto, uh, but many commentators who've listened to the recording don't hear that at all, leading them to reevaluate what the Iron Chancellor really sounded like. Another big find in the Wangemann box was a pair of recordings of Helmut von Moltke, made at his estate in Kreisau, now Krzyżowa, Poland. Uh, Moltke was the main military strategist in the 19th century wars of German unification. In other words, another quite a significant figure, and here's some of what he had to say. Kreisau am Schlesien, am 21. Oktober 'Graph makes it possible for a man who has already rested long in the grave once again to raise his voice and greet the present. Interesting sentiments, and people today often do write about the playback of these very old recordings in terms of bringing people back to life or resurrecting them as though we were engaged in something akin to necromancy. <laughs> but, but notice that Moltke can misidentify the invention the first time around, calling it a telephone. And so I had to say it over again. He wasn't alone in making this mistake. Here's another example from the Wangemann box, uh, this one in English. But, but that's not the only remarkable thing about this bit of audio. Uh, previously, the person with the earliest birth date from whom we had a recording was the Hungarian revolutionary leader, Lajos Kossuth, who had been born in 1802. 
But Helmut von Moltke was born in 1800, technically the last year of the 18th century. So here, for the first time, we have a single voice spanning four centuries. Imagine the crying of a baby in the 18th century, the mature voice of a distinguished statesman in the 19th, the silent potential of a recorded voice throughout the 20th and a resonification through modern technology in the 21st. And there's a wonderful irony here. Moltke's nickname was Der Große Schweiger, the Great Silent One, because he had a reputation for speaking very little. And yet, of all the hundreds of millions of people born in the 18th century, his is the only voice we can hear today. Now, today, whether we're listening to piano performances from the Vienna of 1889 or to the voices of Bismarck and Moltke or, or to any of this material, we, we tend to perceive this as a triumph for sound recording in general. But Wangemann himself perceived his accomplishments specifically as a triumph of the Edison phonograph over its rival, the bell tainter graphophone, which was also being exhibited at the Paris Universal Exposition of 1889. Now, he took that rivalry quite seriously, as is clear from a letter he sent back to Edison from Paris in July, describing the visit of President Carnot of France to the section of the exposition where the two instruments were on display. And I quote just a piece of that letter. I had from the top of the pavilion shouting phonographs, one, vive le président Carnot, vive la République, vive la France, the other cornet with the Marseillaise. It was heard three to 400 feet away while the president inspected the American section and no waving of the American commission or the graphophone people could stop that phonograph, especially not while he was listening to the graphophone. In other words, Wangemann claims to have intentionally kept this Edison phonograph blasting the Marseillaise as loud as possible from the top of the hall while the president of France was trying to listen to the competition's machine, ignoring frantic gestures from the exhibitors of the graphophone, trying to get him to put a sock in it. Uh, and I, I really wouldn't put this past Wangemann, who seems to have been quite a character. Uh, if you need any proof of that, I think this drawing he made some years later of a proposed secret handshake for a social organization <laughs> known as the muckers of the Edison Laboratory ought to provide it. Uh, not to mention his documented practice of ending recordings with la 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 la, hey, here, that's just, if you don't believe me. So, still, his uh, behavior towards the graphophone exhibitors doesn't seem to have been all that sporting, I have to say. So, in the interests of fair play, I'd like to give them the last word this morning. The bell tainter graphophone exhibited at the Paris Universal Exposition of 1889 is preserved today in the Museum of the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers in Paris, uh, CNAM, um, along with a number of cylinders. Um, I recently got an email from Henri Chamou, who many of you will know as the creator of the archaeophone cylinder phonograph, reporting the exciting news that he'd successfully played these cylinders on the 19th and 20th of April, so just under a month ago. It's not absolutely certain when these cylinders were recorded, but chances seem pretty darn good that many of them were made for demonstration purposes at the exhibition. And Henri has kindly given me permission to play you a few excerpts this morning. We'll start with this. <laughs> Next, an excerpt of the Chanson de Fortunio with lyrics by Alfred de Musset and music by Jacques Offenbach. Finally, a snippet of a song that needs no introduction to enthusiasts of early recorded sound. 
It's been an exciting year in archaeophony as exciting new materials have come to light and new playback techniques have enabled us to hear important recordings that formerly seemed unplayable. And the pace of discovery and playback only seems to be picking up. Thank you very much. Thank you.